Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, and I'm joined by attorney Cesar Gavidia. And Cesar, we're going to talk about accountants and long-term disability insurance claims. And the accountant claims have uh, always been challenging because the disability carriers basically use a dictionary of occupational titles and say, oh, you're an accountant, you have a sedentary job. As long as you can sit in a chair for more than six hours, well, usually more than four hours a day, they try to argue, then you're fine. And obviously, if that was all that was required, then people would just say, give me the accounting degree. I can sit in a chair for four hours a day, so I should be an accountant. But obviously, there's a lot more to that, a lot of financial stake, people's financial livings, proper reporting, being audited is a nightmare. How do you present the occupational duties of an accountant when you're representing one? Yeah, so um, Greg, you, you touched on a very, a very good point there. Um, insurance companies look at the occupation of an accountant and, and they think exactly that. Well, they work at a desk or they work in an office and it's primarily sedentary and how much physical functionality is really required to do that job. And they're not thinking about all of those real critical analytical types of, of skills that are required to perform and effectively perform the job of a CPA. And you know, just like any other profession, CPAs can be working internally for, for a company, right? And they're going through spreadsheets and books and, and, all of, and doing all of these uh, you know, computations and, and, and analysis of, of, of data and income and revenue and all of this stuff. Um, and, or they could have you know, their, own, their own solo practice and they're doing uh, tax returns and filings and, and all that type of stuff for, for, cu for cu customers, you know, for, for their clients. Um, so it, it's really important to sit down when you're an accountant and you're uh, pursuing your disability claim and, and going through all those very important substantial and material duties that you consider your bread and butter and what generate and earn all your income for you. But a lot of disability carriers don't realize how stressful of a job it is. And, and a lot of our, and it's not only just in the office, there's a lot of traveling to clients' offices to do audits, to obtain medical records. Most businesses are, are not good at maintaining their books, you know, the, the quasi, what they call the books. Uh, I know a lot more stuff is computerized now, but the accountants often have to go to the offices and it's several times a week. So there is a travel component as well. And the other time is spent basically in front of the computer and long days in front of the computer staring at small numbers on a screen and trying to gather all the information and getting hundreds and hundreds of documents is mentally exhausting for someone who's an accountant. Combine that with the, with the situation where someone has an orthopedic condition, they have a neck problem, a back problem, and now they're a shoulder problem, they're reaching out for a mouse or they're sitting you know in front of the computer hunched over or they're staring at the screen and they're looking down and up and back and and then on top of that they got to focus and what happens if they make a mistake you know if they make a mistake it's going to cost someone thousands and thousands of dollars potentially or they're not going to meet a deadline and then there's going to be penalties and interest so it's a very deadline specific time specific clients are very demanding People are traditionally horrible at documenting things. Accountants ask for things for weeks or months. People, they all get it to them before the deadline. Then accountants are scrambling for extensions yeah. and it's, it's a big babysitting job. I know I'm not great with my accountant. I don't know how you are with yours, but they're always calling. It's Greg, the same I, accountant. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> so, well, you may be better at giving them records than I am. Yeah. And he's always called, Greg, we can't do another extension. So, but I'm not the only person who's like that, you know, so it's a, it's a lot of pressure. Right. Now, we've represented a lot of accountants under this AICPA policy, which is managed by Prudential. Describe your experience with, with that policy and um, how you help claimants to present yeah. a claim under that. Well, as soon as I get a call from any CPA considering or, or thinking about filing a disability claim, that's one of the first questions I ask them. Are you insured under the AICPA uh, Prudential Disability Policy? Because I'd have to say probably somewhere in the range of 70 to 85% of accountants who've contacted us have this uh, prudential disability policy. 
And it's, um, it's very similar to some of the, many of the other prudential group type disability policies that we might see from an employer uh, out there, um, except there, there are some really critical differences. And um, where the, the differences are is basically under that prudential AICPA policy, usually it ensures the CPA for the, their ability to perform the substantial material duties of their occupation, okay? And that's really important. The other thing is that it only often insures them as long as they're a CPA. So, um, and, and I don't, I'm not sure if this is still true amongst all of the AICPA prudential policies because they could, they could sometimes change from year to year. But from the, since the last time I, I've reviewed the policy, is in order to keep that policy in force, you actually act, have to actively be performing work as a CPA. Yeah, which I means that I think it's at least you can't hours. change the occupation unrelated to disability and continue that policy. Right. Well, that is a limitation of that policy. And, and, it, and it's discounted compared to a private disability policy. But I do believe it's an own occupation policy. But I don't know that I, I don't recall off the top of my head. I don't think it allows you to work in another occupation without having an offset to that income which is a disadvantage because you can get out of accounting and maybe go to teaching or something like that. And I think if you earn more than like 20%, as long as you don't earn more than 20% of what you used to earn, you may still be able to collect your full benefit under that policy right. as well as the under 20% amount of money. But the thing with accountants that I think is the biggest struggle we get is that, you know, and again, I'm going to talk about chronic medical issues. It's the accountant who's had the bad back, the bad neck, or has had Parkinson's or MS or a different condition that they've been working through and now they just can't do it anymore. What I see a lot with accountants is by the time they make that determination to make a claim, the disability carrier is going to look back at their tax returns and their earnings. And more often than not, Caesar, we don't see a reduction in their earnings of any significance before they file that claim. So you know the disability company says, look, we don't doubt your, your, your diagnosis, but we know diagnosis doesn't equal disability because if it was, then when you got diagnosed a year and a half or two years ago with your medical conditions, why didn't you stop then? And the reason is that, that the argument from them is, look, you continued working at the same capacity, at least earning the same amount of money. And now you reach the point where you said, I can't do it anymore. And what changed that day if it wasn't for you getting hit by a bus or something traumatic? Why is that your day to disability? How do you how do you deal with that? So uh, you know, I think I think what you're describing is the insurance company's um, kind of focus or obsession in trying to find that causal nexus between the disability, the disabling condition, and the impact to their to their occupation to their income. And uh, yeah, the, that, this is the type of thing where unless, and I've seen it many times, I mean, it's, not, doesn't, it's not exclusive to CPAs, it's, it's exclusive amongst a, probably anybody and everybody who's a professional, who's gone to school for many, many years to earn their degrees and to engage in their profession. Um, and they really try to push through. It's a scary thing to say, okay, I'm just gonna hang it up now, right? It's a scary thing to say, well, I'm going to drop my, I'm going to, you know, just cut my income back or cut my, or cut my, um, my, my workload back or cut back my hours. Uh, it, it doesn't always, it's not always that consistent. I mean, I've seen people push through their conditions and then just burn themselves out to their own physical and mental detriment, right? To where they crash in a year or two, you know, they work themselves to the ground basically. And then Caesar, a lot of accountants I know we, I, I mean, just last week an accountant called me and you know said, Greg, I've been doing this for a while, um, and I'm I'm mentally exhausted. I'm just burnt. I'm just burnt out. Um, it takes me twice as long to review documents. I don't feel like you know it's it's harder for me to return phone calls. I'm not picking up the concepts as quick as I was. And, and obviously that person's experiencing some cognitive difficulties, not that it's someone who has dementia or Alzheimer or something like that. And usually it's secondary to some other medical condition that they have going on, whether it's Parkinson's, MS, you know, chronic pain condition. Um, it could even be a depression and anxiety, something like that that's causing them to have these difficulties. 
how do you go about trying to build up the claim to prove that they're having a cognitive difficulty? Well, it's, it's always important to really chase down the cause of these symptoms, right? To seek medical care. So if you notice that you're having, you know, memory issues, you're not just quite as sharp as you used to be. Um, certainly if you're experiencing depression or anxiety or grief or real, real intense sadness, it's important for you to go into a doctor, okay? That's the number one thing. You have to go and seek medical care. I recently had a client, a CPA as a matter of fact, that was complaining of the very symptoms you're describing here. His, his doctor actually recommended he, that he have a brain MRI. The brain MRI resulted in some pretty significant white matter disease, which is very closely associated with the cognitive type of issues that, you're, that we're talking about here, right? So then there was a referral to a neurologist. The neurologist confirmed the findings, you know? And, and this is important because now you find the causal nexus, the reason why they're having these problems, right? It's not just that the insurance company is going to look at it and say, well, we really don't understand the, subne the subjective nature of these symptoms you're claiming. All right? Now they can see through an MRI report, through the doctor's records, through their opinions, that this is being caused by something very serious, and that's why they can't, they're, they're not performing to the level that they were performing at one point in time. Let's talk about the scenario where you don't find something objective, a positive MRI or CT scan of the brain or anything like that, and it's more a secondary complaint of an underlying diagnosis. How do you utilize neuropsychological testing to your advantage when representing an accountant? Well, neuropsychological testing, I think, can be very beneficial okay, in showing the, leg, the level of cognitive decline that someone's experiencing, right? So it's basically, in a, it's, a, it's a scientifically, objectively accepted test, all right, that you're given by a neuropsychologist. It, it, not just anybody can administer this test to you. They have to be trained in administering this test. And in fact, even the substance of this test, the test questions, the, the testing material, so to speak, is held very confidentially. You know, the, it's very difficult to even obtain that from any neuropsychologist, right? You usually just get the results of this, these exams. And what they'll show is what level of, um, if you're having short-term memory issues, long-term memory issues, um, basically the speed that you're able to executively function, these types of different things that are really critical to someone in the profession of, uh, you know, accounting, right? Because it's these intellectual skills and intellectual qualities that allow you to perform the, 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 the duties that you're performing and to provide the services that you're provi providing to your, to your clients. The, the other thing I really like about the neuropsychological testing is that Two things. Number one is they're comparing you to a pool of thousands and thousands of people that have taken that same exact test as you. And that's where they get the median, the average, above or below. But the thing is with an accountant, you're a high level professional, very high level degree, very challenging education. And you should be testing above average. None of your results should come back at the average because the average is the person who most people who have taken that test don't have your education level. So if you even come back at ed average, it's likely showing a cognitive decline. The second thing I really like about the test and the reason the disability carriers try to beat us to the punch and have, their, have them administer it by their doctors is the fake bad scales and the, the test within the neuropsychological testing to determine if a person is malingering or exaggerating their symptoms. Because Caesar, you know, there's no, you know, it's funny, you said it's a, objectively accepted test, but it's still subjective in the sense that it relies upon the input of not only the person who's taking the test, which would be the accountant, but also the person documenting the results. This is not a x-ray machine that right. looks at the, you know, that looks at the scan and goes, yeah, that bone is broken. No, these are test results that can change based upon if the person taking the test stops their stopwatch half a second late could make them go, above average versus average. Or, so, or even just testing conditions. If you're in a cold room, if you're in a hot room, I mean, right. there's different variables that could completely throw the, test, the testing results off.
But the disability carers try to use this fake bad scale to say, look, you're, you scored a thing that shows you're exaggerating your symptoms and therefore we don't believe you. The, the contrary to that is everything you said came back as valid. And if you have a, an issue where it's a pain related and it's hard to get objective evidence of what's going on with you, this is a very helpful test to show, look, I took basically a psychological evaluation, you know, almost like a lie detector test, but it's not exactly like that. And it proved that I'm not exaggerating, that I'm truthful. And that can be very strong evidence when presenting your claim for an accountant, especially when you're dealing with subjective complaints. So, um, you know, obviously the medical support is going to be tremendous. We just talked on one about cognitive, but we've treated, we've helped accountants with every type of uh, medical issue. And we've seen all the different disability policies out there, even though the AICPA is one of the big ones. We recommend that if you have a claim that you look up your disability insurance company on our website, take a look at all the information we have, whether it's reviews from other claimants, questions and answers that we've done already, reviews of other lawsuits. The reason that's important is we want to educate all of our potential clients and anyone who, who really cares about what's going on to have the most knowledge possible about their company. Because the more knowledgeable you are, the better position you're going to be in to know what you tell your doctor, to know what you tell the company, to know how to conduct yourself when you're outside of your home. And that knowledge is really powerful because it's going to put you in a better position to get your claim approved. And that's the ultimate goal. So wherever you live, we're available to represent you. Whether it's Caesar, myself, or any of the other lawyers on our team, we're always going to offer you a free initial consultation. We appreciate you taking the time to watch our video. We always suggest that you subscribe to our video because we put out helpful videos like this on a weekly basis and gives you a reminder of who we are. When you need us, we'll be here for you. And we appreciate the opportunity for you considering our law firm.